you could open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 10. Hallelujah. I'm so excited about what we're teaching on. I, I, I really thought I'd be here about two months ago, but we finally got here, so it's really good. I'm really, really excited. We're going to talk about an aspect uh, to help you to lay hold of healing, but it's also a principle of faith for anything. And it's, it's a very, very important principle that you know. But in relation to healing, to all the blessings of God for us as a believer, we're going to get a good picture of this principle tonight. Luke chapter 10, let's read verse 1 so that you'll know the context. It says here in Luke 10, 1, After these things the Lord appointed 70 also and sent them two by two before his face, into every city and place where he himself would come. So the context is the way Jesus worked his ministry on the earth. He would send out, he sent out the 12, two by two. Now he send in 70 more of his disciples, two by two. And what he would do is he would send them into villages and cities that he was going to go to. So he would send them there to prepare them for him. And it says here, down in verse 9 is what I want you to see. And this is one of many scriptures. But in verse 9 it says, he, he, he lays out exactly what they're supposed to do. You know, when you go, don't take a coat with you, don't take money with you. I'll provide for everything. But this is what I want you to do when you minister. And then in verse 9 he says, And heal the sick that are there and say unto them. So they're supposed to... They're supposed to, they're commissioned to heal the sick and then to say something to these people. The kingdom of God is come near unto you. If you study the kingdom of God, wherever the kingdom of God is preached, healing was always a result, always connected to it. Healing is a part of the kingdom of God. You cannot separate physical healing from the kingdom of God. It's all over the book. Another, another way to say this is healing is a sign that the kingdom has come. Well, I got to tell you, Jesus is on the earth. Wherever he was, that's where the kingdom was. In the same way, today, the Bible says, our Father says, it's my pleasure to give you the kingdom. And he, and he tells us, the kingdom is in us. So let's jump over, jump over to Luke 17. We're going to look at verse 20. Now, the primary way we look at the ministry of Jesus, and he's our example, the primary way that people were healed in the ministry of Jesus was on their faith. That's the primary way. And so now in Luke 17, verse 20 and verse 21... It says here, and when he, talking about Jesus, was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come. So these Pharisees are coming to him and going, We're, we demand that you tell us when is the kingdom of God coming. So it's amazing because this is one of the few times Jesus answered them. Normally he'd say things like, well, I'll tell you what, if you, whitewashed tomb, answer me this question, then I'll answer you. I mean, he would kind of diss on them a little bit, right? But this time he answered them and said, the kingdom of God comes not with observation. This word in the Greek means it doesn't come with an outward show. This is big. Verse 21. Neither shall they say, lo here, like lo here it is, or lo there it is. The kingdom of God doesn't come like that. It's not going to come like that. But then look at what he says. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Now Jesus is talking about, he, he's basically saying, the kingdom of God will be within you. Okay, you got to see this. The kingdom of God, we know from other scriptures, is in us. We're in the kingdom, and the kingdom is in us. And wherever the kingdom is, it's always connected to healing. There's a big connection there. If you study this, for the believer, and what I want to talk to you tonight, for the believer, healing is from within. And this is going to expose a big thing that the enemy, he steals 
from believers because he gets, we're always looking from without. We're always checking our body to see if we're healing, if we're healed. And we don't have an example of faith that says we do it that way. If you want to know if you're blessed financially, are you going to believe God's word or are you going to believe your checkbook? The Bible says if you want to know that, that where you're at financially, you have to look to the word of God. If you want to know where you are physically in relation to receiving divine healing, you have to look to what God's word says and not not allow the circumstances to move you off of that. So let's talk about that. So the kingdom of God, which includes healing, it's within you. So now jump over to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. We're going to look at verse 10. Verse 10 and 11 in my, in, in, well, there's so many good scriptures. This passage of scripture is one that is in my life continually regarding divine healing. It says in Romans chapter 8, verse 10, And if Christ be in you, how many, how many of you have Jesus in your heart tonight? Right? If you're born again, you have Jesus in your heart. And the Bible says if Christ be in you, if the anointed one and his anointing be in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. He was made to be sin for me so that I through his what? Through being made to be sin, now I've been made the very righteousness of God. So now it says here, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Now look at verse 11. But the spirit, but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you. Again, how many? Does, does the Spirit of God dwell in you tonight? Right? So this is saying, this is very clear. But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead, do you realize the Holy Spirit of God, that Kratos power that came out of Him, that raised Jesus from the dead, is in you. And it's not there to just lay inactive. It says, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also, that's very strong in the Greek, shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells in you. Now this is pretty cool when you look at the word, what does quicken mean? It's not just a tax program, <laughs> right? No, it doesn't mean that, right? What a joke. Here we go. No, it means to make alive. It means to restore to health. It means to heal. If the Spirit, if the Holy Spirit is living in you, the same Holy Spirit that rose Jesus from the dead, if he dwell in you, he will quicken, make alive, heal, restore to health your what? Mortal bodies. How does he do that? By his spirit that dwells in you. Do you think that maybe, look at this, how, look at, if Christ be in you, right? But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, there's two times he's talking about in you. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit, in case you didn't get it, that dwells in you. Healings from within. Okay? To be quickened from sickness and disease means to be healed. Right? Do you ever get tired during a day? Man, draw on that. Father, right now, I just thank you that the mighty Holy Spirit's in me with that power. I pray that you quicken my mortal body. I wonder if that quickening power could heal, could just speed up that healing process a little bit. Right? I wonder what that would look like. Most believers are looking for healing to come from the outside. And this always causes them to be fighting their flesh. Always checking. 
Is it better today? Always wondering when they go to the doctor, is it going to get better or is it not? It's, it consumes your thoughts because Satan is always asking you, so how are you doing today? How are you feeling? Are you think you're okay? Go to the doctor and you get a bad report. Man, do you think this is, think this is going to turn out all right? Why is he doing that? We're going to see there's one reason why he's doing that. To keep you from being fully persuaded that the word of God is true. Because it's impossible for you to look on the outside and become fully persuaded that what God promised is true. This, this, is, a, this is a truth in your walk of faith that's huge. People think that the war is between them and their flesh. Well, I'm just believing that my body will be healed and I'm always looking at my body when I should always be looking at the word. And, and, and really, now will you see your body? Absolutely. But like Abraham, although he looked at it, he considered his body now dead. He saw it the way it was. Faith never denies what you're facing. It never denies it. But it, it denies its right to be there if the word of God is, it says that God already paid for this. By his stripes, I was healed. If you ever, talk, if you ever the language of God, like when he talked to Abraham, we're going to see when he talked to Abraham, he talked in past tense. When he talks to you about your healing, it's always past tense. Because God has already done everything. He has nothing else to do. It's a matter of us receiving See, the war is not between us and our flesh. Ephesians 6.12, what does it say? We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Don't ever let the enemy get you looking at the wrong thing. Right? Focusing on it. Asking those questions, why? Asking those questions, how? How is this going to work out? No, that's God's deal. That's God's deal. You don't wrestle against your own body to obtain healing. We recognize as we get in the word of God that the healing power of God literally resides in us. The Holy Spirit of God, he is the anointing. You know, you got, we got to get that right. We got to get it right. We must, and see, this is, this is another reason we must accept that healing that we're talking about is spiritual, right? It's not, it, we call it physical healing. It's a healing of your physical body, but it's spiritual. But now we have to take a moment in this because of so much wrong teaching. When you, when you say healing is spiritual, some people might hear, oh, this is talking about spiritual healing. Well, number one, your spirit does not need to be healed, right? But if you ever talk to anybody about spiritual healing, they will, they will I mean, every time I have ever meant, heard anybody talk about it, it always ends up being the healing of their emotions. To, to, I need spiritual healing. I need, I need my past hurts to be healed. The only problem with that is it's unscriptural. You, you can't find any basis for it because... In order to heal your emotions, in order to walk free and have your past hurts, no matter how big they are, healed. And when God heals, he removes the scar. You have to renew your mind to the word of God. That's how it comes. It doesn't come. It doesn't come by sitting around and, and letting people lay hands on you and, and you know, you throw up in a bucket or somebody prophesies and you're going to get free. No, people love that stuff. You know, just, hey, just, I'll just come in, lay hands on me, bam, something, someone's going to be hit by something and be set free. Listen, you got to renew your mind. That, that's, I, I'd love to tell you it's a different way, but it's just not. But I will love to tell you that when you renew your mind with the word of God, you will look at past hurts no matter, or past things you've done, past all this stuff that the enemy maybe has tripped you up for 40 years, and you'll look back at it and go, okay, I know that was me, but it doesn't seem like me. It's, it's, it's like it's somebody else. But what that is, 
is when you renew your mind with the word, your father reaches into your mind, the soulish realm of you, and pulls out these plants, uproots them. So there is no, it, you just, you're like, wow. And what happens now is you become more aware of how free you are. Oh, there's people running around to this program and that program and going here and going there, and they're trying to get help when all the time there's one thing that'll bring salvation to your soul. And that is, that's, your soul is your mind, will, and emotions, and that is renewing your mind with the Word of God, putting the Word of God in your heart. If you renew your mind with God's Word, what happens now is you'll start thinking God's thoughts, right? As you're thinking God's thoughts, you're going to start learning His ways. And then what happens as you put God's ways into practice in your life, it positions you to walk in all the blessings of God and walk free. Actually, it, it enables you to lay hold of your salvation. Th this is literally how it works. This is how emotional hurts are healed. It doesn't matter how great they are. Man, some horrible things have happened to people, and I don't want to minimize that. But it's time that we help people. And I'm telling you, in God, you have help. If you make that decision that I'm going to put his word first, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it my undivided attention. I'm going to ever keep it before my eyes. I'm going to keep it in the midst of my heart. I'm going to meditate in it day and night. And I'm going to literally observe to do everything that's written therein. See, the Holy Spirit can just work with you and help you. And he'll walk you free from everything. Renewing your mind with God's word. What does it mean? Number one, it means accepting his word to be true. Number two, and then being a doer of it. That's literally how you renew your mind. You accept it to be true, and then you do it. Now, here's the thing. When you accept it to be true, your flesh might not want to do it. So, But as you keep meditating in the word of God, it will literally build a bridge that will take you from not wanting to do it to doing it. So what the word... What am I saying tonight? If, there, if you leave with nothing else, put all the pressure of what you're believing God for, both in your personal life and in, in, in whatever God's called you to do, put all the pressure on the word. Take all the pressure off you. Because we're, we're not to walk in that pressure. Physical healing, what are we saying? It has a spiritual source. Sickness and disease have a spiritual origin. There's something that's deeper than just the symptoms that we're seeing. There, there's, there's something deeper than cancer cells that you can see on a microscope or in, in different tests. There's something deeper than diabetes and leukemia and all this stuff. There's something deeper. It has a spiritual source. God looked at everything that he had made in creation and he said it was all good. There was no sickness and disease that showed up until Adam and Eve, they rebelled against God, they sinned, and then the Bible says sin came into the world because of that and death came in by sin and now is why we see sickness and disease. There's a spiritual root. Sickness and disease is not just the presence of some bacteria, a germ, a joint that doesn't work, that's, that's, it's more than that. There's something behind that. Charles Mayo, the, Charles Mayo, the founder of the Mayo Clinic in Minneapolis, years and years ago, he said, there is a source of sickness and disease that goes much deeper than any surgeon's knife can reach. He knew there was something deeper. There's a spiritual source, and I got to tell you, healing, it's a spiritual source. And when you believe the word of God and speak it, and you lay hold of healing, it'll just, just like that fig tree that Jesus cursed, 
the healing power of God will literally, from the Holy Spirit, come right out of your spirit and go right to that organ or right to that joint or whatever and kill the spiritual root. And then what, what's the result of that is healing will come in your body. Sickness and disease had no way into this world until Adam and Eve fell. Another way to say this, to simplify it, is sickness and disease, it basically is a product of what? Spiritual death. Okay? When spiritual death came, that's where sickness and disease is. The spiritual source of God's healing power is what? The finished work of Jesus. He was made to be a curse so that we literally would be bought out of the curse of the law, which included sickness and disease and poverty and lack. It included spiritual death. He took our place. We call that the great exchange. Many Christians are trying to fight sickness in their body. Stop it. This never works because every time what you'll do is you'll start judging. If you're fighting sickness in your body, you'll start judging to see if you're healed based on the symptoms that you're seeing or based on what the doctor says to you. Nope. The Bible says, who has believed, right? The report of the Lord, Isaiah 53, 1. That's who the arm of the Lord will be revealed. People are trying to attack physical sickness and disease from a physical body change position. Okay, I know if, if, this, if his word is working in me because my symptoms are getting better. That's not where you want it. That's, that's not how you know you're healed. Right? If, if, you're, if you're fighting flesh and blood, you're violating even Ephesians 6. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. This is, a, this is a spirit, you know, principalities, powers, spiritual wickedness in, 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 he, in the heavenly places, right? All of these, we're, we're fighting a satanic hierarchy. So we got to keep our eye, and the Holy Spirit will always keep your eye on Jesus, on the word, because that's how you stand in all of this. You're not fighting against your own flesh. You got to know this. The Holy Spirit is the source of healing. Let's read it again, Romans chapter 8, verse 11. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwells in you. Does that make sense? So now let's look at Abraham's example. Go over to Romans chapter 4 now. We're going to start in verse 17. This is the greatest. God has laid out in his word. This is one of the greatest examples of faith. And you got to understand, Abraham, what the condition that we're talking about here is, is beyond the natural. Right? God came to him when he was 75 years old and said, Abram, I want you to leave your father's house and go to a place and show you I'll make you rich, but I want you to go to where I tell you to go. Abraham, who was the firstborn in his family, had an inheritance, a major inheritance there, and he walked away from it to follow God. God promised him a son. And then you fast forward at age 99. Now, you got to understand, Abraham and Sarah... Now, Sarah must have been a young, very, very attractive lady because when she was older, a king wanted her, right? But she couldn't have children even when she was young. So now we fast forward all the way to 99 years old, and this is when this story is happening, all the way to 99. So that's 24 years, and in 24 years, Abraham and Sarah have kind of let go of the promise. But something happened to them. We know it had to be less than a year to where they figured it out. And so let's look at this story. So you got to understand, 99 years old, we're talking about an impossible physical 
It's impossible. Sarah can't have children. Abraham can't function and do what is necessary to have children. It's impossible. It's an impossible situation. It's, it's beyond stage four cancer. It is you're on your deathbed, and I'm sorry, there's nothing that can be done. That's what this situation is. It's really interesting that something took place in the life of Abraham and Sarah. They figured out something on how to lay hold, and they had a son. And actually, they went on and had more sons. So look at verse 17. It says, talking about Abraham now, as it is written, now it's quoting Genesis 17, 5. God says, I have made thee a father of many nations. Notice that. I have made thee a father of many nations. When he spoke this to Abraham, Abraham had no children. I, past tense, have made thee a father of many nations. Before him whom he believed, even God. Well, who's God? He's the one who quickens. There's that word quicken again. He makes alive the dead and calls those things which be not as though they were. Isn't that, I mean, I love the wording of this. It's not, it, it, it's not that, and calls those things that be not as though they are. No, as though they were. It's finished. Do you see the consistency there? This is the language of faith. Calling things that are not as though they were is the language of faith. Calling things that are as though they're not, that's not faith. So we don't run around saying, I don't have, I, I don't have a sinus infection if I have a sinus infection. That's not faith. That's calling something that is as though it's not. No, I walk around saying I'm healed. Oh, yeah, you know, right now, if I were to go by my feelings, yeah, my head feels like it's going to explode. However, I am fully persuaded that what God said, that by his stripes I was healed, so I'm fully persuaded of that. Now I'm calling, I don't say I'm not sick, I say I'm healed. Now I'm calling those things that be not as though they are. Do you see that? This is a huge thing. Verse 18, so here's Abraham. Now, now picture this. He's 99 years old. Can we have church? You know what it takes for a man, right, to, to be able to do what he needs to do. He's 99. It's not happening. Who against hope, who against all natural hope, and then if that's not enough, he looks at his wife who's 90, who went through the change of life decades ago, who against hope believed in hope. Abraham had no natural hope that he and Sarah could have a child. But he chose to believe God anyway. I hope you're starting to get excited. Because this is why in the word of God it says, all things are possible to him who believes. This is why it says, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. The, I mean, start to get your life, a picture of your life as if everything God promised you is absolutely true. Because it is. It's not complicated. Here's Abraham. He's like, man, I'm done. My wife's done. That in the natural, there's absolutely no way. But guess what? God said, and I have more respect for the truth of his word than I have for any facts that I see with my eyes. That's faith. This is why you got to know healing spiritual. For that matter, you know poverty and lack? That, that's not physical. That's not monetary. That's spiritual. There's a spirit of poverty. There's a spirit of lack. 
You have complete authority over them, but they'll never stop messing with you unless you start, unless you mess with them. Right? It's the way it is. And I'm telling you, we're learning this stuff and we'll be able to walk in victory. We'll be able to walk in this earth and be a light in this world so people could have hope. Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken. Everything is according to that which was spoken. Tony Finley will live long on this earth and declare the works of the Lord according to that which was spoken. Tony Finley can do all things through Christ who strengthens him according to that which was spoken. Tony Finley always triumphs. His heavenly father always causes him to triumph in Christ according to that which was spoken. If you have God's word on it, you don't need to look at anything else is what we're saying. Amen? Hallelujah. According to that which was spoken, so shall your seed be. Verse 19 and now, this is a big one in the King James Version. I, I just recently have talked about this in church, uh, but I want to go through it again. Uh, in the King James Version, it, it really uses the same Greek words because it's a word-for-word -word transliteration. That's why I like the King James. And with the tools you have now, you can tell if there's something not right, you can tell because of, of the Greek words or the Hebrew words in the Old Testament. But in the King James Version, verse 19 says, And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about 100 years old, neither the dead, deadness of Sarah's womb. The King James says he didn't consider his own body now dead. So I'm telling you, you've got a bunch of people that freak out and think, Oh my gosh, if I look at my situation at all, I'm not in faith. Well, that's not what, that's not what the Greek says. And the American Standard Version, if we could pull that up, the, or you, I guess, you know, the true Baptist, like, like I grew up Baptist, will say the New American Standard Bible, right? Uh, but they do a great job with the Greek wording, and, it, and it, it gives you a true meaning of this verse. So I'll read it to you. It's up on the screen. It's, it says, without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body, or that means he considered his own body now as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Without, so this is saying without becoming weak in faith, he considered his own body. You can look your circumstances right in the eye and not become weak in faith. Isn't that good news? So keep this in mind and let's keep going. It is not a weakness in faith to consider your circumstances. It is not a weakness of faith to consider the weakness in your flesh. Abraham is not denying that his body is now dead. In the same way, faith does not deny the circumstances that you're facing. Abraham, without being weak in faith, considered his body now dead in the deadness of Sarah's womb. But don't stop there. Right? He looks at Sarah, he looks at him, goes, yep, dead. Right? He might not have said it that way. His wife would have slapped him. Right? <laughs> Abraham was, not, here, here's what, this is what this is saying. Abraham was not looking at his body to tell him what his answer is. This, you got to get this. Don't look at your checkbook to see if the power of God is working in your finances. Don't look at your emotions and at your feelings to tell if you're in depression or not. Don't look at your body in order to tell whether you're healed or not. This is what it's saying. Abraham was not looking at his body to tell him if he was healed or if he would have a child. Abraham was not looking at his body or Sarah's body to tell him 
if things were starting to work in the right direction or not. Right? You can see it. People, they get in faith. And man, if things get better at all, you could always tell, man, they're looking at their body to see if they're healed. Because if they start feeling better at all, oh, praise God. And before then, it's just like, yeah, you know, I'm just believing God. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm thoroughly convinced I'm healed. But then if they feel better, wow, I believe God, I'm healed, you know, right? But then if they get up the next day and they, they're a little worse, oh, yeah, wow. And, in, and, and what they start doing, the enemy's on their shoulder going, man, I wonder why, what's happening. And, and if they start to, if they're at all judging their healing by what they're seeing outwardly, they're going to they're gonna start, they're gonna, he's going to trip them up. They're going to let go. Healing's from within. Your proof is from within. It's unseen. It's the word of God. And it never changes. And he, as we sang tonight, he's faithful. Abraham did not judge the truth of what God promised him by what was going on in his or Sarah's body. They got this right. They, they got it wrong for 24 years, but they finally figured it out. And somewhere, because by the time he was 100, they had a child. Wow. Guys, it's not too late. This is how you believe God for everything. This is why you never put, faith never puts pressure on people. Right? Nothing. No, you don't put pressure on anybody. You get God's word, and now I take God's word and I start looking at it, and I start meditating in it, and I start rolling it around, and I start speaking it over and over and over. And day by day, as I refuse to believe anything above his word, I become more and more fully persuaded that that's the walk of faith. Fully persuaded. That means if I believe God and things go back the other way to where it looks like, oh my gosh, what's going to happen now? I don't consider that. Because I refuse to give as much respect that I have for God's word, I refuse to give that respect to a circumstance. There's no way. And that's in you. You are your spirit man it's, you're, like, you're like a terminator, man. You're like a pit bull. You grab hold. Your spirit will grab hold of the word. And your spirit, you want to dominate in life. You want to overcome. And you want to, and here's the thing. We do it by resting. We do it by resting. Verse 20, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. This word stagger means to oppose or to differ or to contend with. He didn't oppose the word of God. He didn't differ or contend with. Wow, you know, this is just not working out. He didn't do that. He staggered not at the promise of God. How, how do you stagger at the promise of God? It's only through unbelief. Guess where unbelief comes from? It's, a, it's your choice. Based on Romans 10, we know where it comes from. It comes because we started hearing the wrong thing. And then we started thinking the wrong thing. And then we started believing the wrong thing. So now we're saying the wrong thing. So we don't want to do that. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith. How was he strong in faith? Giving glory to God. The New American Standard Bible says, yet with respect to the promise of God. I love that. He, he considered his body, with, verse 19, without growing, weak in, or without growing weak in faith, right? He was strong in faith, even though he considered his body, but he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. I love the New American Standard because it says, yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, and then he, this brings out the Greek that I love. See, in the King James it says, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. In the Greek language, it's progressive. He did not waver in unbelief, 
but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God. You grow, your faith grows. Abraham did not allow his body to tell him or to convince him on whether or not God's word is true. He, he literally, when God came to Abraham and said, Abraham, is anything too hard for me? Everything changed in Abraham's life if you study his life. He realized, nope, I'm fully persuaded that whatever God says, he will do. He said he'd make me rich, he made me rich. He said that he, he'd make my name great, my name's great. He said that he'd do that so that I'd be a blessing. Man, I've been a big blessing. Now he also said all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed through, through me because I'm going to have a son with Sarah. Guess what? I'm fully persuaded. He had a spiritual source as his answer, God's word. And he, yet with respect to God's word, he didn't waver. This is huge, guys. This is why if you're around here, you hear me all the time. You got to be a doer of the word. A doer of the word, he continues looking. He, he never takes his eyes off the word. He doesn't live for himself. He lives for God. He walks and eats and breathes the Lord. My determined purpose is to know him. I don't care what I believe. I know in whom I believe. And if he said it, it's truth. And I'll bet my life on it. I'll bet my eternity on it. I will not be moved by what I see or what I feel. That is in all of us. And the more you feed and the more time you spend with God, the more you become fully, you just become fully persuaded day by day. He had a spiritual source to overcome the condition of his body. This is how healing works. You have a spiritual source. Psalm 120 or 1720. He sent his word and healed me. Right? Isaiah 54, verses 4 through 6, which ends in, by whose stripes I am healed. Right? Surely he bore my sickness and carried my pain. Matthew 8, 17, God's word tells me that Jesus himself, my Savior, my Redeemer, Jesus himself bore my sickness and carried my pain. 1 Peter 2, 24, by whose stripes I was healed. If I was, then I am. Right? So symptoms, I'm not moved by you. You have to leave my body. Right? He had a spiritual source to overcome the condition of his body. What is that source? The source is God's word and the mighty Holy Spirit. That's the source. It's a spiritual source. He grew strong in faith looking to the promise of God. But the only reason why he looked to it is because he respected it. My son, attend to my words. This is the hard part of American Christianity because we have everything else first. And, and in order to walk like this, you have to have God first. Otherwise, it's, it's, not, it, it's, it's just you'll let go. You'll give in to what you see or what you feel. So very, very important. He grew strong in faith, looking to the promise of God. Looking unto the promise of God kept him from being swayed in his body in the same way that you looking to the promise of God will keep you from being swayed. You won't be moved by a doctor's report. You won't be moved by symptoms getting worse. You'll stand firmer. Looking unto the promise of God kept him from being swayed by his body. So that's the question. Are you going to respect the truth of God's word? Or are you going to give respect to what you see, what you're feeling, right? What you can touch, what you can feel, what, you, what you're smelling? Abraham recognized his and Sarah's bodies were dead. Did you get that tonight? I've, I've probably only said that 20 times. He didn't let that make him weak in faith. And the only reason why he was able to do that is because he put, he put greater respect in what God said. Now remember, you can't trust someone you don't know. 
This is why John 17, 3 says, eternal life is knowing God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ whom he sent. This is so important. He didn't let that make him weak in faith because he put greater respect on God's word. And while looking to the promise of God, what happened to Abraham is he grew strong in faith. So what will you give respect to? The facts in your body or the truth of God's word? The reason why I'm saying this over and over is because guess what? You're probably not going to be tested tomorrow only. But you'll probably even be tested tonight. If you're believing something tonight, right? Before you get home, the enemy will be talking to you about how I'm an idiot and that's just ridiculous. And you know, don't listen to all that stuff. Right? And I would say, don't listen to me. Listen to him. Because he'll never let you down. His word is not subject to change. It's forever settled in heaven. And he submits to it. So if he said, whoever's born of God overcomes the world, then you're a world overcomer. Tonight, you could rejoice in that. So don't let the circumstances or your past failures or anything, who cares about that? I'm not going to deny that. I'm just going to say, hey, no, I'm, I'm, I found out. I'm a world overcomer. So hide and watch. Because everything's going to come in line with that, right? Yeah. Amen. This is why God uses this example in the word of God to reveal to us how faith works. So look at verse 21 now in Romans 4. You guys doing good? Yeah. I'm telling you, I can't even put into words the importance of you learning this. And how you learn it is not by sitting here tonight. You learn it by taking notes and then asking the Holy Spirit to bring revelation and then meditating in these scriptures. And then in your life, he will show you areas of your life, what you need to do to always be walking this way. And you'll learn how to walk this way. The walk of faith, it, the fight of faith is to become fully persuaded. And it, and it comes by having respect for the word of God above everything else that you're seeing. Verse 21, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Oh, thank God. Jesus, his eyes run to and fro in the whole earth, showing who he can show himself strong on behalf of. His eyes watch over his word to perform it. Man, that's good news. The fight of faith, as we just said, is to become fully persuaded that what God has said is the ultimate truth and the ultimate reality in my life. If God said it, that's it. That, I, I believe it. Do I have to understand it? No. But he'll bring understanding to me. But I don't have to understand it. I know him. If he just said it, it's good enough for me. Jesus, you don't have to come back down and heal me. I believe. I wasn't here 2,000 years ago, but I'm blessed because I believe 2,000 years ago you healed me of everything that I'll ever face in life. Right? So the fight of faith is becoming fully persuaded that what God has promised is truth. This is a process. It's not just a, an event. Everybody would love for it to be an event, but it's a process. The process of renewing your mind to God's promises. That's how you become fully persuaded. Always put all the pressure on the word of God, not on yourself. So let's look. In this passage, there's two elements of growing strong in faith. Number one, giving glory to God. If you're not giving glory to God, it's going to be very difficult for you to be strong in faith because that's a byproduct. Number two, Number two is becoming fully persuaded. And this is where the fight is. This is where the fight is. This is where the enemy is going to be talking to you. Well, what about this circumstance? And what about that? And this isn't getting any better. And he'll bring people around your path. And, and, and some of your best friends will all of a sudden start making fun of you. And, and this and that. And, and I mean, all this stuff will happen for one purpose and one purpose only. 
to keep you from being fully persuaded that what God promised is true. He doesn't want you to know that. He looks at the promise of God to keep him from wavering while he gives glory to God for what he didn't receive yet. So Abraham kept looking to the promise of God and he kept giving him glory. What that means is, he, you don't think the enemy was on his shoulder? Boy, have you noticed how you don't have a child yet? And Abraham, looking to the promise, what did he do? Father, I thank you. If I could number this sand as you told me, I'll be able to number my seed. All day, all day he would, he would just say it over and over. And then at night, as these thoughts were coming, man, sometimes he'd just get up, go to the door of his tent, walk outside and look at the stars. Oh, Father, I just give you glory and I thank you that if I could number these stars, which I can't, I would be able to number my seed that's going to come from me. I thank you for the son I'm going to have. What was he doing? He was meditating in the word. Day and night. Do you see that? That's exactly what he was doing. And what he was doing is he's becoming fully persuaded. Every day. So here's the thing. The more the enemy comes at you and says, but, but what about this? You need to say, oh yeah, and but it is written Father, I thank you that I'm strong in you, that I'm above only and not beneath, that by your stripes I'm healed. I thank you for that. See, you turn that around every time. Hallelujah. He's meditating on what God said. The more he does this, the more he becomes fully persuaded. What Abraham is doing, how you grow fully persuaded, how you grow in faith, it's literally by renewing your mind to God's word. The battle of the believer is to become fully persuaded that God's promise of healing is the final authority, the final truth, and the final reality. That is the battle for you to become fully persuaded. And here's the thing. People will sit here and go, well, you know, no, I'm fully persuaded, Pastor. A person who's fully persuaded would never... Act like that. A person who's fully persuaded, he's not going to waste his time saying, I'm fully persuaded. No, 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 no. You, Therese, you got, did you read this? Teresa, we, we got to get together. We got to go over the word. Man, the word is so good. This is what a fully persuaded person does. D Dwayne, I mean, I was just reading my Bible today and I saw 1 Peter 2, 24, by whose stripes I was healed. Brother, I'm healed. Forget about this, well, I'm fully persuaded. I'm not going to waste my time saying that. No, no, I'm going to talk about the word all the time. I'm never going to let it depart out of my mouth. I can't help myself. Matthew 12, 34, it says, out of the abundance of my heart, my mouth is going to speak. I'm going to speak of his goodness all the time. Why? Because I'm fully persuaded. See, God talked to Abraham in the past tense. I have made you a father of many nations. He talks to us by whose stripes you were healed. Right? We, we have been bought out of the curse of the law. Jesus himself bore my sickness and carried my pain. That's past tense. Because guess what? Jesus did that 2,000 years ago. In Abraham's case, it means that God has done everything See, when God said, Abraham, I have made you a father of many nations, what God was saying is, Abraham, I have done everything that I have to do to make you a father of many nations. I'm done. So I want to, just in these last couple minutes, I want to reveal one other part of this, so very important. This means as far as God is concerned, it's settled. It's done. Like 1 Peter 2.24 for us, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness. Sounds a lot like Romans. By whose stripes you were healed. God is saying, I've done everything that I need to do for your healing. It's done. 
It's all done. In Abraham's case, it means that God has done everything that is needed for him to be a father of many nations. So now let's go on. Nowhere does it say that because Abraham believed God, that some special power came on him and Sarah, zapped their body, and they were able to have a son. It doesn't say that. And that's what the enemy will try to get you to say. He'll try to get you to believe that you're going to become fully persuaded that the word is true. And some healing power of God, God's going to just, he's going to send something and zap you and you're going to be healed. Don't, no, 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 no. It's done. I'm already healed. God's not going to do anything else. It's a matter of me becoming fully persuaded so that I lay hold of my healing. See, this is just a little thing, but you got to get it. You got to get this. You got to feed on it to get it. Our faith doesn't make God move to bring our healing. God moves to bring us healing. When did he do that? 2,000 years ago. Now, now, now hear me. Our faith doesn't make God move to heal us. You got to get this right. God healed us 2,000 years ago. Why? Because of his love and compassion for us. The Bible said he received the promise. Why? Why did Abraham receive the promise? Because he focused on what God said. He didn't focus on the promise so God caused it to happen. Because God already took care of it. When he spoke it, it was done. God's word is the spiritual source. So now, now hear me on this. Abraham realized his body was not his problem. What you can see, that outward thing that seems to be your problem, is not your problem. You don't wrestle against flesh and blood. The issue is, are you going to keep looking at the promise so that you become fully persuaded, so that you could lay hold of what God has already done for you. You get it? Some of you are starting to see that. We focus, or his focus was to become fully persuaded that what God said he would perform. Okay? Satan gets us looking at our body to keep us from being fully persuaded. So most of us look and go, well, God's word says I'm healed, but my body says, oh my gosh, what's going on? And then, we, then here comes the big question, I wonder why this is happening. Right? People let their body bring them into unbelief. Don't do that. What's going on in your body is nothing compared to when God speaks and says, by my son's stripes, you were healed. It, that'll drive sickness and disease out of your body. The Holy Spirit quickens your body as you focus on God's word instead of focusing on your circumstances. When you realize that my fight is not against my flesh, my fight is to become fully persuaded that what God said he gave me, he'll perform it and I'll be able to grab it and bring it into this realm. Becoming fully persuaded is a meditate day and night. It's a day-by-day -day thing. you got to get rid of statements like this. But my body, but the doctor said, you got to get that out of your vocabulary. you got to get in your vocabulary what God said. This is why we're to hold fast to the confession of our faith without wavering. That homo logeo is that word confession. It means to say the same thing that God says. Satan will come with but, but you got to respond to it is written, but with saying it is written. The more you give God glory and keep your eyes on the promise, the more it will cause you to grow into becoming fully persuaded. You tap into God's power by giving glory to God and becoming fully persuaded. 
God did not put gifts of healings, workings of miracles, special healing anointings to heal the church. He put those gifts, and they are to operate in the body of Christ. We have Christians who are so incredibly overweight spiritually that they sit there and go, oh man, why do, why do more gifts not happen? Well, the reason why is because there's hardly any unbelievers in our midst. Why? Well, because I'm more concerned with watching BVOVN and I'm more concerned with my life because I'm constantly fighting my own flesh, my own finances, my own circumstances. Man, I'd love to witness to somebody, but I'm up to here with me. I'm saying get rid of it all. Amen. And get your eyes on the Lord. Because those gifts of healing, those working of miracles, that special faith, that is to operate to show people the glorious gospel of Jesus and to drive them to him. Now, will they work in the church? Yeah, but that's not where they're going to work predominantly. Well, we just want to see the gifts of the Spirit. You know, I don't like this church because they don't have a tongue and interpretation every Sunday. Have you ever been in a church like that? Where sister so-and-so on the second verse of the third song always has the tongue and the interpretation, and you're cringing because you're like, okay, whatever. Or am I going to get another word of prophecy that says, oh man, I've opened the windows of heaven above you, Tony, and you're going to change the world. Okay. That's great. But the Bible says that to me. Right? But oh my gosh, it's amazing what happens when you go out and you're witnessing to somebody and you're like, hey, the Spirit of God just told me you need to stop having an affair with this person. Her, this is her name. And the person's like, why? I don't even know you. No, no, no. I don't know, but God loves you. What? Right? Or rise up and walk. I mean, you see this all throughout the Old Testament, or, I mean, all throughout the New Testament. We have the Holy Spirit of God in us to quicken our mortal bodies. Yes, our, you know, could there be a healing evangelist come and you get healed? Yeah. But why wait for that? The Holy Spirit's in you tonight. And notice it didn't say, oh, only if you've received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. No, no, it says that the Spirit dwell in you. Listen, if you're born again, the Spirit of God's dwelling in you. Now, I highly recommend the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I love my prayer language. I was praying, I, I do it all the time. Gives me direction, helps me in worship, I give thanks well. All of these things, direction comes the gifts of the Spirit, I love them. Word of knowledge, word of wisdom operates in me a lot. Prophecy works in me all the time, every service. I mean, it's wonderful. But let's get fully persuaded. This is what's going to change your life. Because when your life starts looking like what the Word says, doesn't the Word say, if you abide in Him, you should walk like He walks? Yeah. I'm telling you guys, we're starting to get it. We're starting to walk like he walks. And I'm telling you, it, the net of your life is going to yield all your fruit. And you're gonna, you're, you don't have to figure out what to say. You're going to know what to say. And the anointing will be there. And everything will start working. And while you're seeking first the kingdom and you're growing the kingdom of God, he'll take care of your life. All of a sudden, you'll notice that a pain that's been in your back forever is no longer there. All of a sudden, you'll go for a checkup and blood levels that have been out of control for a while are back in, they're just in control. Why? Because you're fully persuaded. Amen. Is it too good to be true? No. This is your day. This is your time. This is our inheritance. Amen.